Just after the coup in Niger, both America and France announced that they didn't recognize the military junta. They even went as far as saying that they don't take orders from an illegitimate military junta, and they won't call their troops back. But now, after they have seen Niger's strength, they are now trying to beg and negotiate with Niger. They know that Russia is entering the African continent, presenting African countries with a permanent solution to terrorism and violence. This has scared America and France because if that happens, Russia will become a permanent ally to Africa. Not only that, but the terrorist organizations will be uprooted, and there will be no excuse for the West to come to Africa. Earlier, it seeped into Africa on the excuse of terminating terrorism, which it did not do deliberately to prolong the stay. Now America and France have no option but to beg Niger, as Russia has already started something which is making the West sweat. What is it? Let's know about that in this video. France has preserved its colonial habit of exploiting the resource-rich countries that were its former colonies. Today, it's the only country that wants deep interest in the countries it has been plundering for centuries. That's why most countries in the Sahel region and the Francophone African countries still face exploitation by France. After giving independence to African countries, France ensured it could loot the resources. Therefore, it made unfair agreements, besides creating violence and terrorism in the region. This was done to clear the path for French and other Western countries' troops to enter African countries. Apparently, these troops were to fight terrorism. But secretly, they were safeguarding only French interests. Sometimes, they blackmailed African presidents into submission, threatening to bring coups against them. In all this, the U.S. helped France, as we saw in the case of Libya, when NATO invaded the country and was directly involved in killing Muammar Gaddafi. But African countries noticed an odd trend. Despite being in Africa for decades, the French troops could not terminate terrorism. Or perhaps they were never given the task to uproot terrorism in the first place. If they wanted, it would only take only a few years. But this would have ended all excuses for French troops to stay, so they prolonged the fight. Now African countries like Niger have kicked French troops out. Even if France has three military bases in Niger and the U.S. has a drone base, the orders are strict. French troops have already started to leave while the U.S. Pentagon prepares its withdrawal strategy. However, all this is for the world. Deep inside, both France and the U.S. do not want to leave. It's because the French military bases safeguard French interests in the country, while the U.S. drone base allows it to spy on the entire continent. Depriving them of these bases, means making the West blind. For example, Niger Air Base 201 operates as a United States drone air base close to Agadez, Niger. Positioned about 5 kilometers southeast of Agadez, the base is officially owned by the Nigerian military, but was constructed and funded by the United States. Mainly used by the U.S. military for drone operations, the site proves to be an effective tool for the U.S. for surveillance missions. Operations at Base 201 began on April 19, 2016, accommodating General Atomics MQ-9, Reaper-armed drones and larger Boeing C-17, Globemaster III transport airplanes. The Congress approved a budget of use $50 million for the base, but the total cost has surpassed $100 million. Why would the U.S. spend such an amount on something that does not offer direct benefits? Well, Niger Air Base 201 stands as a strategic asset for the United States, with a primary focus on intelligence gathering and surveillance. Firstly, as a pivotal location for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions, Niger Air Base 201 utilizes unmanned aerial vehicles or drones to gather information through surveillance and reconnaissance activities, providing real-time data on various aspects of the region. The base also plays a critical role in monitoring security threats in the region, particularly in areas affected by instability, terrorism, or other potential risks. Drones are deployed to observe and track movements, identify potential threats, and contribute to situational awareness. Moreover, the U.S. utilizes the drone base for executing targeted counterterrorism operations. But it's the U.S. that defines what is terrorism and what is not. Drones are deployed to identify and engage individuals or groups associated with extremist activities, contributing to efforts to combat terrorism in the region. 
The intelligence collected from ISR missions at Niger Air Base 201 is crucial for broader military operations. This information supports the planning and execution of military strategies, enhancing the effectiveness of U.S. and allied forces in the region. Additionally, the U.S. aims to contribute to regional stability and security through active monitoring and addressing of security challenges. But what's more, in this way, it keeps an eye on what's going on in the country, besides gathering intelligence on the neighboring African countries. Therefore, both the U.S. and France are trying to negotiate with Niger. The sole goal is to prevent Russia from entering Niger. As the Russian Wagner Group is present in most African countries, and is helping them get rid of terrorism forever, the West feels scared here. Also, the West does not want African countries to get closer to China. In simple words, since China offers economic benefits and Russia has the ability to offer security, they both create a lethal combination against the West. What's more, Russia and China have already proved their importance to Africa. The 43 African heads of state attending the inaugural Russia-Africa Summit in 2019 were optimistic about Russia becoming a major source of investment and trade for the continent. Russian President Vladimir Putin pledged to double Russian-African trade to $40 billion within five years. Russia's influence in Africa has significantly expanded since the first Russia-African summit. This growth occurred through genius means such as supporting isolated, autocratic regimes with Wagner paramilitary forces, engaging in electoral interference and arms for resources deals. Moscow gained favor with these regimes by shielding them from international sanctions for so-called human rights violations or undermining democratic practices. While economic ties between Russia and Africa remained modest, the continent offered Moscow a global platform to enhance its geostrategic image. Africa remained receptive to Russian engagement and was less inclined to criticize Moscow for its actions in Ukraine, as evidenced by numerous visits by Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov since the attack in March 2022, Africa's importance to Russian foreign policy was growing. The West is seen to criticize Russia's growing influence in the Central African Republic, Mali, and Libya, breaching the country's sovereignties. But what about the military presence of the US, France, and the UN? If the Wagner Group possesses a sovereignty crisis, why do Western countries have troops in African countries? That's the double standard the West always uses. Many argue that the hesitancy of numerous African states to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine openly stems from the deep ties established by Moscow during the Soviet era, generating ongoing sympathy and respect for Russia. Beginning in the mid-1950s, as Africa became a pivotal Cold War arena, the Soviet Union actively reshaped the continent's political and security landscape. Moscow generously provided economic and security assistance to various local Marxist, anti-colonial, or anti-U.S. groups, supporting independence movements and aiding governments facing internal or external challenges. The Soviet Union gained influence in major African countries, including Algeria, Angola, Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, and Mozambique. The Kremlin supplied weapons, offered military training and advisors, and fostered relationships between the Soviet and various African intelligence communities, leaving a lasting legacy of Soviet hardware and operational culture throughout Africa. Following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the newly established Russian Federation, grappling with political and socioeconomic turmoil, had to disengage from the continent. This abrupt halt resulted in marginal Russian activity in Africa for about two decades. Later, Visible attempts by Moscow to re-engage with the continent began in the mid-2000s. In 2006, President Vladimir Putin visited South Africa, followed by his successor Dmitry Medvedev's trips to Egypt, Angola, Nigeria, and Namibia in 2009. The Kremlin intensified its diplomatic efforts after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, seeking new geopolitical partners and business opportunities due to Western sanctions. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. Since 2014, high-ranking Russian officials, including Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, Security Council Secretary Nikolai Patrushev, and Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Bogdanov, have visited various African states, signing multiple bilateral military, 
economic and security cooperation agreements and writing off billions of dollars in African debts. This has consistently made the West jealous and scared of Russia's growing influence in Africa. Russia's return to Africa coincided with reduced U.S. engagement with the continent, including the 2018 decision under the Trump administration to scale back U.S. counterterrorism efforts in the region. Moscow quickly filled the resulting security void. In 2019, President Putin hosted the first Russia-Africa summit in Sochi, reinforcing Russia's status as a reliable strategic partner on the continent and securing military contracts with nations like Nigeria, which agreed to purchase Russian attack helicopters. Despite war, sanctions, and Western pressure, 17 heads of African states attended the second Russia-Africa summit in July 2023. Signing agreements on arms race prevention in space, informational security cooperation, and combating terrorism on the continent. Moscow also promised additional debt relief. These ongoing diplomatic efforts, encompassing high-level visits, debt relief, and strategic partnership agreements, have proven valuable at the United Nations. The Kremlin has secured the backing of many African nations on key UN votes, challenging the United States and its allies within international frameworks, such as resolutions condemning the Russian annexation of Crimea and attempts to demilitarize the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. In return, Africa gets much-needed security from Russia. Since France and the UN never really tried to terminate terrorism from African countries, Russian troops can prove effective. They can participate in active combat and train African troops to be able to fight terrorists. Therefore, while Russia's economic and trade impact in Africa might be moderate, its defense and security ties with the continent are robust, involving arms sales, joint military training initiatives, and the activities of Russian private military companies PMCs. Russia emerged as the primary arms supplier to Africa, constituting 40% of the continent's major weapons imports between 2018 and 2022. This surpasses the combined arms imports from the United States, which stands at 16%, and France, which stands at 7.6% during the same period. According to a RAND Corporation report, Russian weapons sales to Africa have surged from around $500 million to over $2 billion annually in recent years. Notably, North African countries Algeria and Egypt are significant importers, with 73% and 34% of their arms acquisitions, respectively, coming from Russia. Since 2013, these nations have invested billions in Russian weapons and equipment, including combat aircraft like the Su-24, Su-30, and MiG-29, and missile systems like the S-300. Beyond Algeria and Egypt, several other African nations, including Mali, Sudan, the Central African Republic, and Angola, also receive Russian military supplies. The reliance of African countries on Russian-made weapons can be attributed to several factors. Modern Russian arms are often more cost-effective than Western alternatives and compatible with Soviet-era stockpiles many African states retain. Moreover, unlike the United States and its allies, the Kremlin does not attach conditions related to democratic principles or human rights protection to its arms deliveries. This flexibility has enabled Russia to supply armor, combat aircraft, and missile systems to conflict-ridden African countries, such as Libya, where it supported the military efforts of Eastern Libyan strongman Khalifa Haftar against the UN-recognized government of national accord. In addition to arms transfers, Moscow has pursued military diplomacy in Africa through participation in Russian-led military forums and exercises. The International Army Games, attended by around a dozen African states since 2015, exemplifies these efforts. Russia has also organized annual Naval Friendship Bridge and Aerial Defenders of Friendship exercises with the Egyptian Army and supported UN peace operations in Congo, Western Sahara, Sudan, and South Sudan by providing limited military observers. Although the official Russian military presence may seem modest, Russian PMCs substantially augment this presence across the continent. Estimating the exact numbers of Russian PMCs or their operations in Africa is challenging. Still, available reports indicate the existence of at least seven Russian PMCs involved in a minimum of 34 operations across 16 African countries since 2005. 
The surge in PMC activity occurred in the mid-2010s, following Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 and its intervention in the Syrian war in 2015. The Wagner Group stands out among these PMCs. This has allowed the African countries to judge which military would be better for the terrorism in their countries. Either they can pick French and US troops who have stayed for years and did nothing, or they can pick the Wagner Group and other Russian military groups to end terrorism within no time. Wagner's operations in Africa involve advising struggling leaders, conducting pro-government and disinformation campaigns, providing military training, and participating in anti-insurgency operations. The group's activities span countries such as the Central African Republic, Sudan, South Sudan, Congo, Gabon, Libya, Mali, and Madagascar. Wagner's presence in Africa is remarkable for its alignment with Kremlin interests, exemplifying Russia's trade of PMC services for access and economic concessions in resource-rich, fragile states. The group's involvement in providing security to officials, arms deliveries, on-site military training, and engagement in gold and diamond mining in Sudan and oil market access negotiations in Libya underscores the multifaceted nature of Russian PMC influence in the region. As Russia offers security, China takes care of the economic interests of Africa. China and Africa share a deep-rooted friendship founded on the principles of Chairman Mao Zedong and other first-generation leaders of the People's Republic of China and African politicians. This enduring connection has been marked by China's consistent demonstration of respect, appreciation, and support for Africa. The Chinese people have weathered both challenges and triumphs alongside their African counterparts, paving the way for a distinctive path of cooperation. At the FOCAC Beijing Summit in September 2018, both parties committed to the ambitious goal of building an even more robust China-Africa community of shared future, ushering in a new era for their relations. China's approach to Africa is encapsulated in the principles of sincerity, real results, and good faith as well as the principles of pursuing the greater good and shared interests. You should know that these values are common in African countries. In the past, African countries only engaged with the West and faced their hypocrisy and double standards. But when China comes and engages with African countries, offering equal respect and a relationship of equality, it creates a stronger bond. These principles embody the essence of Chinese culture, and showcase the historical traditions of China-Africa friendship, serving as a model for international cooperation with Africa. Sincerity reflects how China treats its African friends, deeming solidarity and cooperation with African countries integral to its foreign policy. This commitment remains determined as China strengthens, supporting Africa's stance on global and regional matters. China remains committed to aiding African countries in resolving continental issues contributing to peace and security. Additionally, China supports African countries in charting development paths suited to their national conditions, promoting governance experience exchanges, and fostering common development and prosperity. Real results represent China's dedication to achieving tangible outcomes in its cooperation with Africa. As a champion of win-win cooperation, China integrates its development with Africa, aiming to enhance the conditions in African countries. China provides support and assistance within its capacity, honoring commitments to expand cooperation in investment and financing, particularly in agriculture and manufacturing. The objective is to help African countries leverage their resources for independent and sustainable development. China has poured hundreds of billions of dollars into Africa's infrastructure, supporting key projects such as expanding Zimbabwe's Huangay Power Station. Prominent African cities like Lagos, Nairobi, and Addis Ababa have witnessed transformative changes due to Chinese-funded initiatives, including developing railways, highways, and airports. Despite the West's propaganda, China's beneficial investment in Africa is set to increase, as stated by Wang Wenbin, a spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry. He underscored that China's investments in Africa align with the continent's development needs, resulting in advantages for both Chinese and African populations. Wang expressed confidence in the continued growth of Chinese investment in Africa, attributing it to collaborative efforts between the two sides to expand cooperation. Ban the recent Africa's Dynamic Development Report, 
a collaboration between the OECD and the African Union, spotlighted China's greenfield foreign direct investment in Africa, reaching $10.14 billion from 2017 to 2022. This constituted 18% of the global greenfield FDI inflows into Africa, placing China on par with Europe and the US. Wang acknowledged the report's findings, emphasizing Africa's status as a continent full of opportunities and a promising investment destination. He noted the substantial progress in investment cooperation between China and Africa in recent years, guided by the leadership of both Chinese and African leaders. China's investment in Africa has displayed consistent growth and holds promising prospects. In the first half of this year, China contributed $1.82 billion in FDI to Africa, indicating a 4.4% year-on-year increase. Wang highlighted the growing confidence of Chinese companies in the African market, with over 3,000 Chinese enterprises deeply invested in Africa and more than 70% being private companies, constituting the backbone of Chinese investment in the continent. Despite baseless accusations from some Western officials and media outlets attempting to tarnish Chinese investments in Africa, Chinese officials and analysts assert that Chinese investments in the continent will continue to rise. Wang emphasized that as the African continental free trade area progresses, Chinese companies will encounter more facilitation and new opportunities to explore and invest in the African market, contributing to high-quality cooperation between China and Africa. Wang highlighted the positive impact of Chinese investments on local communities, including job opportunities and infrastructure development. Many Chinese companies operating in Africa have local employees who actively contribute to community development by building bridges and roads, drilling wells, installing streetlights, and promoting technology transfer, local procurement, and personnel training. These efforts have played a significant role in modernizing Africa's agricultural, manufacturing, and services sectors, improving manufacturing and processing techniques, and creating greater value added thereby contributing substantially to African countries' stability, development, and prosperity. Now, no matter how much the US and France beg Niger and other African countries not to establish ties with Russia and China, the change has been made. African countries have judged well that Russia and China offer more benefits than the West, something Africa needs now to become the center of the world. What do you think? Should African countries like Niger give another chance to France and America, and break ties with Russia? Or is it a good opportunity to get rid of the West forever and forge new ties with Russia and China? Let us know your thoughts on which countries Africa should ally itself with. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about. The black culture, civilization, history and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.